Section 13 of The Hungry Stones and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doc Stull. The Hungry Stones and Other Stories by Rabindranath Tagore. Translated by C.F. Andrews. The Kabuliwala. My five years old daughter Minnie cannot live without chattering. I really believe that in all her life she has not wasted a minute of silence. Her mother is often vexed at this, and would stop her prattle, but I would not. To see Minnie quiet is unnatural, and I cannot bear it long. And so my own talk with her is always lively. One morning, for instance, when I was in the middle of the seventeenth chapter of my new novel, my little Minnie stole into the room, and putting her hand into mine, said, Father, Romdial, the doorkeeper, calls a crow a crew. He doesn't know anything, does he? Before I could explain to her the differences of language in this world, she was embarked on the full tide of another subject. What do you think, Father? Bola says there is an elephant in the clouds, blowing water out of his trunk, and that is why it rains. And then, darting off anew, while I sat still making ready some reply to this last saying, Father, what relation is mother to you? My dear little sister-in-law, I murmured involuntarily to myself, but with a grave face contrived to answer, Go and play with Bola, Minnie. I am busy. The window of my room overlooks the road. The child had seated herself at my feet near my table, and was playing softly, drumming on her knees. I was hard at work on my seventeenth chapter, where Protop Singh, the hero, had just caught Kanchanlatha, the heroine, in his arm, and was about to escape with her by the third-story window of the castle, when all of a sudden Minnie left her play and ran to the window crying, A Kabuliwala! A Kabuliwala! Sure enough in the street below was a Kabuliwala, passing slowly along. He wore the loose soiled clothing of his people, with a tall turban. There was a bag on his back, and he carried boxes of grapes in his hand. I cannot tell what were my daughter's feelings at the sight of this man, but she began to call him loudly. Ah, I thought, he will come in, and my seventeenth chapter will never be finished. At which exact moment the Kabuliwala turned and looked up at the child. When she saw this, overcome by terror, she fled to her mother's protection and disappeared. She had a blind belief that inside the bag, which the big man carried, there were perhaps two or three other children like herself. The peddler, meanwhile, entered my doorway and greeted me with a smiling face. So precarious was the position of my hero and my heroine that my first impulse was to stop and buy something, since the man had been called. I made some small purchases, and a conversation began about Abdurrahman, the Russians, the English, and the frontier policy. As he was about to leave, he asked, And where is the little girl, sir? And I, thinking that Minnie must get rid of her false fear, had her brought out. She stood by my chair and looked at the Kabuliwala and his bag. He offered her nuts and raisins, but she would not be tempted, and only clung the closer to me, with all her doubts increased. This was their first meeting. One morning, however, not many days later, as I was leaving the house, I was startled to find Minnie, seated on a bench near the door, laughing and talking, with the great Kabuliwala at her feet. In all her life, it appeared, my small daughter had never found so patient a listener save her father, and already the corner of her little sari was stuffed with almonds and raisins, the gift of her visitor. Why did you give her those? I said, and taking out and ate on a bit, I handed it to him. The man accepted the money without demur, and slipped it into his pocket. Alas, on my return an hour later, I found the unfortunate coin had made twice its own worth of trouble, for the Kabuliwala had given it to Minnie, and her mother, catching sight of the brown round object, had pounced on the child with, Where did you get that eight on a bit? The Kabuliwala gave it to me, said Minnie cheerfully. The Kabuliwala gave it to you, cried her mother, much shocked. Oh, Minnie! How could you take it from him? I, entering at the moment, saved her from impending disaster, and proceeded to make my own inquiries. 
It was not the first or second time I found that the two had met, that Kabuliwala had overcome the child's first terror by a judicious bribery of nuts and almonds, and the two were now great friends. They had many quaint jokes, which afforded them much amusement. Seated in front of him, looking down at his gigantic frame in all her tiny dignity, Minnie would ripple her face with laughter and begin, Oh, Kabuliwala, Kabuliwala, what have you got in your bag? And he would reply in the nasal accents of the mountaineer, An elephant! Not much cause for merriment, perhaps, but how they both enjoyed the witticism. And for me, this child's talk with a grown-up man had always in it something strangely fascinating. Then the Kabuliwala, not to be behindhand, would take his turn. Well, little one, and when are you going to the father-in-law's house? Now most small Bengali maidens have heard long ago about the father-in-law's house, but we, being a little newfangled, had kept these things from our child and Minnie at this question must have been a trifle bewildered. But she would not show it, and with ready tact replied, Are you going there? Amongst men of the Kabuliwala's class, however, it is well known that the words father-in-law's house have double meaning. It is a euphemism for jail, the place where we are all well cared for, at no expense to ourselves. In this sense, would the sturdy peddler take my daughter's question? Ah, he would say, shaking his fist at an invisible policeman. I will thrash my father-in-law. Hearing this, and picturing the poor, discomfited relative, Minnie would go off into peals of laughter, in which her formidable friend would join. These were autumn mornings, the very time of year when kings of old went forth to conquest, and I, never stirring from my little corner in Calcutta, would let my mind wander over the whole world. At the very name of another country, my heart would go out to it, and at the sight of a foreigner in the streets, I would fall to weaving a network of dreams. The mountains, the glens, and the forests of this distant home, with his cottage in its setting, and the free and independent life of far-away wilds. Perhaps the scenes of travel conjure themselves up before me, and pass and repass in my imagination all the more vividly, because I lead such a vegetable existence, that a call to travel would fall upon me like a thunderbolt. In the presence of this Kabuliwala, I was immediately transported to the foot of an arid mountain peaks, with narrow little defiles twisting in and out amongst their towering heights. I would see the string of camels bearing the merchandise, and the company of turbaned merchants carrying some of their queer old firearms and some of their spears journeying downward towards the plains. I could see, but at some such point Minnie's mother would intervene, imploring me to beware of that man. Minnie's mother is unfortunately a very timid lady. Whenever she hears a noise in the street or sees people coming towards the house, she always jumps to the conclusion that they are either thieves, or drunkards, or snakes, or tigers, or malaria, or cockroaches, or caterpillars, or an English sailor. Even after all these years of experience, she is not able to overcome her terror. So she was full of doubts about the Kabuliwala, and used to beg me to keep a watchful eye on him. I tried to laugh her fear gently away, but then she would turn round on me seriously and ask me solemn questions. Were the children never kidnapped? Was it then not true that there was slavery in Kabul? Was it so very absurd that this big man should be able to carry off a tiny child? I urged that, though not impossible, it was highly improbable. But this was not enough, and her dread persisted. As it was indefinite, however, it did not seem right to forbid the man the house, and the intimacy went on unchecked. Once a year, in the middle of January, Rapan, the Kabuliwala, was in the habit of returning to his country, and as the time approached, he would be very busy going from house to house, collecting his debts. This year, however, he could always find time to come and see many. It would have seemed to an outsider that there was some conspiracy between the two, for when he could not come in the morning, he would appear in the evening. Even to me, it was a little startling now and then in the corner of a dark room, suddenly to surprise this tall, loose-garmented, much-bebagged man, 
but when Minnie would run in smiling with her, Oh, Kabuliwala, Kabuliwala, and the two friends so far apart in age would subside into their old laughter and their old jokes, I felt reassured. One morning, a few days before he had made up his mind to go, I was correcting my proof sheets in my study. It was chilly weather. Through the window the rays of the sun touched my feet, and the slight warmth was very welcome. It was almost eight o'clock, and the early pedestrians were returning home with their heads covered. All at once I heard an uproar on the street, and, looking out, saw Rahman being led away, bound between two policemen, and behind them a crowd of curious boys. There were blood stains on the clothes of the Kabuliwala, and one of the policemen carried a knife. Hurrying out, I stopped them, and inquired what it all meant. Partly from one, partly from another, I gathered that a certain neighbor had owed the peddler something for a Rampuri shawl, but had falsely denied having bought it, and that in the course of the quarrel, Rahman had struck him. Now in the heat of his excitement, the prisoner began calling his enemy all sorts of names. But when suddenly in a veranda of my house appeared my little Minnie, with her usual exclamation, O oh, Kabuliwala! O oh, Kabuliwala! Rahman's face lighted up as he turned to her. He had no bag under his arm today, so she could not discuss the elephant with him. She at once, therefore, proceeded to the next question. Are you going to the father-in-law's house? Rahman laughed and said, Just where am I going, little one? Then, seeing that the reply did not amuse the child, he held up his fettered hands. Ali, he said, I would have thrashed that old father-in-law, but my hands are bound. On a charge of murderous assault, Rahman was sentenced to some years' imprisonment. Time passed away, and he was not remembered. The accustomed work and the accustomed place was ours, and the thought of the once free mountaineer spending his years in prison seldom or never occurred to us. Even my light-hearted Minnie, I am ashamed to say, forgot her old friend. New companions filled her life. As she grew older, she spent more of her time with girls. So much time, indeed, did she spend with them that she came no more, as she used to do, to her father's room. I was scarcely on speaking terms with her. Years had passed away. It was once more autumn, and we had made arrangements for our Minnie's marriage. It was to take place during the Puja holidays. With Durga returning to Kailash, the light of our home was also to depart to her husband's house and leave her father's in the shadow. The morning was bright. After the rains, there was a sense of ablution in the air, and the sun rays looked like pure gold. So bright were they that they gave a beautiful radiance even to the sordid brick walls of our Calcutta lanes. Since early dawn today the wedding pipes had been sounding, and at each beat my own heart throbbed. The wail of the tune by Ravi seemed to intensify my pain at the approaching separation. My mini was to be married tonight. From early morning noise and bustle had pervaded the house. In the courtyard the canopy had to be slung on its bamboo poles. The chandeliers with their tinkling sound must be hung in each room and veranda. There was no end of hurry and excitement. I was sitting in my study, looking through the accounts, when someone entered, saluting respectfully, and stood before me. It was Rahman, the Kabuliwala. At first I did not recognize him. He had no bag, nor the long hair, nor the same figure that he used to have. But he smiled, and I knew him again. When did you come, Rahman? I asked him. Last evening, he said. I was released from jail. The words struck harsh upon my ears. I had never before talked with one who had wounded his fellow, and my heart shrank within itself. When I realized this, for I felt that the day would have been better omened had he not turned up. There are ceremonies going on, I said, and I am busy. Could you perhaps come another day? At once he turned to go, but as he reached the door he hesitated and said, May I not see the little one, sir, for a moment? It was his belief that Minnie was still the same. He had pictured her running to him as he used to, calling, O oh, Kabuliwala, Kabuliwala. He had imagined, too, that they would laugh and talk together just as of old. In fact, in memory of former days, he had brought, carefully wrapped up in paper, a few almonds and raisins and grapes, obtained somehow from a countryman, 
for his own little fun was dispersed. I said again, there is a ceremony in the house, and you will not be able to see anyone today. The man's face fell. He looked wistfully at me for a moment, said good morning, and went out. I felt a little sorry, and would have called him back, but I found he was returning of his own accord. He came close up to me, holding out his offerings, and said, I brought these few things, sir, for the little one. Will you give them to her? I took them and was going to pay him, but he caught my hand and said, You are very kind, sir. Keep me in your recollection. Do not offer me money. You have a little girl. I, too, have one like her in my own home. I think of her and bring fruits to your child, not to make a profit for myself. Saying this, he put his hand inside his big loose robe and brought out a small and dirty piece of paper. With great care he unfolded this and smoothed it out with both hands on my table. It bore the impression of a little hand, not a photograph, not a drawing. The impression of an ink-smeared hand laid flat out on the paper. This touch of his own little daughter had always been on his heart as he had come year after year to Calcutta to sell his wares in the streets. Tears came to my eyes. I forgot that he was a poor Kabuli fruit seller. Well, I was, but no, what was I more than he? He also was a father. That impression of the hand of his little Parbati in her distant mountain home reminded me of my own little Minnie. I sent for Minnie immediately from the inner apartment. Many difficulties were raised, but I would not listen. Clad in the little red silk of her wedding day, with the sandal paste on her forehead, and adorned as a young bride, Minnie came and stood bashfully before me. The Kabuliwala looked a little staggered at the apparition. He could not revive their old friendship. At last he smiled and said, Little one, are you going to your father-in-law's house? But Minnie now understood the meaning of the word father-in-law, and she could not reply to him as of old. She flushed up at the question, and stood before him with her bride-like face turned down. I remember the day when the Kabuliwala and my Minnie had first met, and I felt sad. When she had gone, Rahman heaved a deep sigh and sat down on the floor. The idea had suddenly come to him that his daughter, too, must have grown in this long time, and that he would have to make friends with her anew. Assuredly, he would not find her, as he used to know her. And besides, what might not have happened to her in these eight years? The marriage pipes sounded, and the mild autumn sun streamed round us. But Rahman sat in the little Calcutta lane, and saw before him the barren mountains of Afghanistan. I took out a banknote, and gave it to him, saying, Go back to your own daughter, Rahman, in your own country, and may the happiness of your meeting bring good fortune to my child. Having made this present, I had to curtail some of the festivities. I could not have the electric lights I had intended, nor the military band, and the ladies of the house were despondent at it. But to me the wedding feast was all the brighter for the thought that in a distant land a long-lost father met again with his only child. End of Section 13 Recording by Doc Stull Arcata, California. End of Hungry Stones and Other Stories by Robin Tronoth Tagore. Translated by C. F. Andrews.